from the New Arts and Media Studios in Milwaukee. I'm Charles Bursell. This is The Log. Uh, <laughs> Joe Biden, I got I to gotta share this with you. The, if this story doesn't just epitomize Joe Biden and the Democratic Party, uh, there's some lefties in there that I like. The Progressive Caucus, not bad, but this is just quintessential. Headline, Biden Task Force Releases Report Recommending Strengthened Labor Unions. You know, back in the day, like half of the workforce was unionized. By the time uh, Reagan came around, it was over 20%. Since then, it's dropped down to, I think, less than 10% or maybe just at 10%. So the union numbers are bad. And study after study, all the research tells us the exact same thing. There is no no argument. The consensus is that union strength makes everybody better. It improves working conditions. It improves wages for everybody across the economy, whether you're in a union or not. The stronger the union movement is, the stronger workers' positions are across the board. So uh, if you want a good life, join a union, organize a union, or at least, at the very least, support unions. All right, well, here's what the very bold Joe Biden and the Democratic Party came up with. Reading now from PBS NewsHour. A Biden administration task force on organized labor on Monday issued a set of recommendations that could make it easier for federal workers and contractors to unionize. Okay, first of all, it's a task force. That means, you know what that means, right? It's, that's right, like writing a report for school. It's a task force. I task you to go out and look at this issue and then bring back a report and read it aloud in front of the class, please. So that's what a task force is. All right, so it's on organized labor. They issued a set of recommendations. All right, what do you think the chances are that these recommendations are going to become law in any way? They're going to be passed by Congress. Ta! To laugh. That they're going to be uh, presidential executive orders that could just be reversed when President DeSantis takes uh, takes the Oval Office. Uh, okay, <laughs> I'm still just on the first sentence here. Recommendations that could make it easier. Oh, they could. That, not saying they will, but they could. Anything can happen. Could make it easier. No, not could guarantee. No, they could make it easier for federal workers. Oh, wait a minute. What's that? Oh, federal workers, not just not just workers, just federal workers, not all workers. So they could make it easier for not all workers, but federal workers. So that... <laughs> One damn sentence is just filled with qualifiers. Uh, this is what the Democrats do. This is why I can't stand the Democrats. Uh, 70 distinct policy proposals in this report they submitted to President Joe. <laughs> the, the, I don't, I'm sorry. I can't help it. I can't. I got to laugh. Biden created the task force chaired by Vice President Kamala Harris with Labor Secretary Marty Walsh as vice chair through an executive order last April. Oh, there you go. Getting things done, Joe! The report argues that a decades-long drop in union membership has coincided with a rising share of income going to the top 10% of earners. No kidding. Thank you. You think we needed you to tell us that? I guess this is just like a kid writing a school report, uh, just Googling a couple of things and copying down what a million people already know. This is embarrassing. This is the this is your Democratic Party, people. I just I started out laughing. Now I'm not laughing anymore. This is infuriating. It further says that most Americans have a favorable impression of unions and would join one if given the option in a vote. Yeah, we know this. You don't have to give us your uh, your little Google 10th grade school report. <sighs> and even this namby-pamby little task force report gets backlash 
from business groups, reading again from the article. These business groups say that union strikes and work stoppages could worsen economic challenges such as the supply chain squeeze and high inflation. Well, of course, that goes against every, I mentioned earlier, it goes against every word of study and research that's been done on this. Unions are good for the economy. They're bad for profits, maybe. In the end, they're good for profits, but these types don't understand enlightened self-interest. It's only short-term goals. I can pay you less, I can fire you, and then make you do more work, more money in my pocket. That's all they see. Oh, safety concerns? we got to spend money now on protective equipment? We have to care about? You know, don't get me started. I'm already started. Today's report from the White House Task Force is nothing more than pro-union propaganda and exemplifies how entrenched pro-union allies are in this administration, said Kristen Swearingen. Swearingen. She's missing a T in her name. It really ought to be Swearington, but it's Swearingen. Swearingen? 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 You got a crummy name, Kristen. Change it. Chair of the Coalition for a Democratic... Oh my God, listen to the name of her coalition. Coalition for a Democratic Workplace? God, mighty house. What this Orwellian world we live in. This anti-union, union-busting organization has the chutzpah to call themselves the Coalition for a Democratic Workplace. <sighs> It's composed of more than 500 business groups, including the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the American Trucking Association. You know, the other night I was watching a little um, South Park because I like South Park. And uh, every once in a while, I'll just I'll tune into Comedy Central and see if uh, see if they got something going on. And they had the, the episode where they're having a big election at school to vote on the school mascot. And the uh, and the boys don't like this. So they do this big campaign for write-in candidates, uh, Giant Douche and Turd Sandwich. <laughs> this is a, an infamous South Park episode. You may be familiar. <laughs> so then it becomes this big, and the, those two wind up being the top two for the big runoff. So the big vote now is between Giant Douche and Turd Sandwich. And of course, you know, the, um, the creators of South Park Matt and Trey, are libertarian, centrists. They're the worst offenders of both sidism. They're just the worst. I mean, South Park is hilarious. It's very funny, and I enjoy it to no end. But Matt and Trey's politics are way too centrist for me, and they're, they're both siding all the time. So the big metaphor, of course, was that every election, and they, they come right out and say it, um, they're so in your face with their, with their political satire. Every election from the beginning of time is the choice between a giant douche and a turd sandwich. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, but just a reminder, as I criticize the Democrats, I don't put them anywhere near the same league as Republicans who have gone far off the cliff. We, we spent a whole episode yesterday talking about that. They've been driving off the cliff for the last 40 plus years, and they are airborne right now. So no, I, I never, ever equate the Democrats with the Republicans. Never will you find me doing that. I will yell bloody murder about the Democrats because I'm mad as hell at them most of the time. But you'll never hear me both sides in it. Why does this come up now? Why does it come up now? <laughs> Oh, I'm looking at this article. The giant douches who came up with this stupid, toothless report just to feel good about themselves and make their voters feel good, but not actually get anything done. And then the turd sandwich that labels them as Stalinists, basically. It's just, you know, yeah. Giant douche, turd sandwich. Absolutely. All right. Just uh, had to mention that. Good Lord. Hey, there's something going on here in my uh, home state of Wisconsin. If you're anywhere near Wisconsin or anywhere near a telephone or an email machine, maybe you want to contact Governor Tony Evers 
because on his desk right now is SB 296, also known as AB 279. It's the uh, it's been passed now by both houses in the state legislature. It's one of these um, anti riot bills, so called, and they passed it, and it's sitting on Evers' desk. I don't expect he'll sign it, but why hasn't he already vetoed it? You got to tell him. You got to you got to call him. You got to email him. Uh, as I've mentioned several times here in Wisconsin, and I'm not sure how many other states are in this situation, a Republican legislature on both sides, both the Senate and the Assembly are Republican controlled, due entirely to gerrymandering, by the way, and then a, a Democratic governor. So he's able to stop these horrible bills that they keep passing. And uh, according to um, according to U.S. protest law tracker, a great site that tracks all of these, there are just hundreds of these bills. According to that website, this one is still pending here in Wisconsin. And if, I'm sure you've heard of this, right? They uh, uh, Let me read now from, I'm not sure where I'm reading from. A friend of mine posted this. It would newly define riot under Wisconsin law such that peaceful protesters could face steep penalties. Currently, Wisconsin law broadly defines an unlawful assembly as a group of three or more people who cause a disturbance of public order and make it reasonable to believe the group will damage property or people. The definition specifically includes a group of three or more who assemble to block a street or building entrance. All right, so that's the current law. And protesters know the law, and they know it's this is as old as time. It's basically civil disobedience. If you block a street, you're breaking the law, you're making a point, you're getting on the news, it's civil disobedience. You go to jail, and like Martin Luther King did many times, and he writes, <laughs> writes his letter from Birmingham jail that lives in the, in the great icons of American documents. All right, so we, this is how things work and how they've always worked. There have been laws, and protesters know what the laws are, and they choose to commit civil disobedience. And uh, it's been the way we've done things forever, and I think it's actually not a bad system at all. Well, under the new bill, an unlawful assembly in which at least one person commits an act of violence that creates a clear and present danger of property damage or injury, or threatens to commit such an act and has the ability to do so, or commits an act of violence that substantially obstructs some governmental function, is now a riot. All right. <laughs> Those are an awful lot of terms. Unlawful assembly, act of violence, clear and present danger, substantially obstruct the word riot itself. And it's such a wide interpretation that really this is an anti-protest bill. This bill, there's no two ways of saying it. It criminalizes all protest. As soon as one little thing happens in a, in a group of a thousand people, if one person shoves another person in anger because they didn't share their ice cream cone, now the police can, can label this thing a riot and every single one of those thousand people in this assembly are now responsible and can serve time in jail. Let me read how, how they put it here. A large street protest... Okay, this is just what I was saying. As such, a large street protest where a single participant threatens to push somebody could be deemed a riot with no actual violence or property damage being committed by anyone. Under the bill, anyone who attends a so-called riot or refuses an order to disperse a riot commits a Class A misdemeanor, punishable by a mandatory 30 days and up to nine months in jail and a $10,000 fine. If the riot results in substantial property damage or injury, again, all these terms can be loosely defined to apply to anything. If the riot results in substantial property damage or injury, anyone, anyone who attends commits a class one felony. You hear me? Anyone in that assembly, if something bad happens at this assembly and you are attending this assembly, you can could be charged with committing a class one felony punishable by up to three and a half years in prison. This is nuts, you guys. The bill also creates a new class A misdemeanor for any person who incites or urges 
three or more people to engage in a riot. Are you hearing all my quote unquote inflections here? <sighs> the bill does not define incite or urge. Finally, if a person obstructs any public or private thoroughfare or any entrance to a public building while participating in a riot, it is an additional Class A misdemeanor. So this, I, I read this one to you. This is the one in Wisconsin. These are all over the place. 45 states, <laughs> Lord, 45 states have considered these kinds of laws, these anti-protest laws. 243 bills have been introduced, 50 of which are currently pending. Many have either expired or have been defeated. But 243 bills introduced, 50 are still pending, 36 have been enacted. In Florida, well, pretty much all the red states, I'm looking at the map here, most all of the red states have enacted these kinds of laws, including Wisconsin. I should say. This is, but this is the big one that's still pending. So we can't let this happen anymore than, than it already has. 36 laws enacted, completely anti-democratic, just 100% anti-free speech. And I love that the same people who are making excuses for the January 6th insurrectionists, who are calling that legitimate political discourse, those are the very same people that are passing these kinds of laws. So make sense of that, if you would, please. Lord mercy, you guys. A recent poll tells us that 72% of Americans think the U.S. is moving in the wrong direction. <laughs> well, at least this reporting doesn't really break it down. Because, yeah, I'm, more, I'm part of that 72%. Of course I am. How can you look at this country and not say we're moving in the wrong direction? But people see that, and they think that that, that number automatically agrees with them. I'm aware enough to realize that a portion of that 72% are right-wingers who think that we're all radical communists who want to take away all of their rights. And a part of that 72% are left-wingers and moderates who look at the Republican Party and see the power that they've garnered over the years, the state legislatures we were just talking about, this whole minority rule thing that we spent yesterday's episode talking about. So that's the, that's the part of the 72% I'm in. Yeah, we are going in a very dangerous direction. The, the damn uh, in, uh, income inequality has been steadily growing since the 1980s. I don't mean to keep harping on... Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, but I can't help it. This is because everything we're facing now, pretty much everything we're facing now was planted in the 80s under Ronald Reagan. And income inequality right on top of that list. The gap between the rich and everyone else has been growing and growing and growing every single goddamn year for 42 years. Yeah, I'd say that's wrong direction. Climate crisis which is just right now at our doorstep. We're feeling the effects of it. People around the world are dying because of climate crisis. And we're doing nothing. We're doing literally nothing. Oh, yeah, there's a city here. There's a state here. You'll hear about nice, good-sounding initiatives. But <laughs> I'm sorry. So, yeah, we're moving in the wrong direction. The climate crisis is worsening while we do nothing. Democracy is right at death's door unless we do something drastic to save it. So yeah, we're moving in the wrong direction. And then I'm sure there's a great portion of this 72%. Again, the, this particular reporting doesn't break it down. I'm sure a lot of this 72% is saying, oh, well, America is too partisan. We just can't get along. We need to get along with each other. So they're saying we're moving in the wrong, in the wrong direction because some Americans are so extreme. Those are the centrists who are ruining America. They're the ones who enable the constant drift right. So there are lots of reasons to say that America is moving in the wrong direction. There's only one right reason. <laughs> okay? Those who say that the lefties are taking us off this socialist communist cliff, they're wrong. They're just factually wrong. 
and they're ideologically and politically wrong. Centrists who say, oh, well, the two extremes are are dividing the nation and they have to stop with their extreme rhetoric and we all have to come together in the middle. They're wrong. They are absolutely 100% wrong because they're equating, they're both siding, the left and the right, people who want the best and people who just want what's best for them. So the centrists are wrong. We all think America is going in the wrong direction, but for different reasons. Those two factions are wrong. I'm right. You and I are right. <laughs> we just got to somehow try to increase our numbers. We just try to got to try to make people understand. And, and I, I promise I won't get too wrapped up in this because I tend to get wrapped up in things. You know, you know, I do that. <laughs> but I just want to make it clear once again, some of us believe in a certain ideology because it's best for everyone. For example, I think a universal basic income and universal health care and separating work from money, all of the things I talk about, because I think they're good for all people. They're good for all people around the globe and in this country. I want policies that will benefit everyone, including the most rednecked cracker you can find in the Bible Belt. I want, I want them to have a good life also. I want them to benefit from the policies I'm proposing. Now, this is something that I'm going to also give credit to the centrists of the world. At least they want the right thing. They're wrong about how to get it. I completely disagree with, with their political theory on how to achieve these things. But they're basically good people who want the best for everyone. They certainly don't want to make any sacrifices in their own lives. They don't, they, don't want, they don't want any cost. So that's where my generosity ends. I'm not going to compliment them there. No, they're, they're decent, good people who want the right thing. But they're not willing to make the sacrifices needed. They just really believe that this mythical center, both sides coming together, is the right way to go. They're, well, they're just wrong. And then there's the, the right-wingers who really believe, and they come right out and say it. <laughs> I don't have to put words in their mouth. They just want what's best for them. Everybody else can suck it. Whereas I believe, and, and what, as I understand most lefties to believe, we want a good world for everyone. The right-wingers, the radical right-wingers, who are currently airborne off the cliff, don't give a damn about anyone except themselves. They want to keep their money. They want to keep their white supremacy. Again, we talked about all this yesterday, so I won't get into it. But people win and people lose, according to their political theory. Some people just fail. It's, it's not anybody's responsibility to help them. This is just the system we live in. You got to work hard. You got to make your money. You got to dig. You got to claw. You got to cheat. You got to steal. Do what you do. Just completely married to capitalism, completely married to money. Do what you need to do to win. And if you lose, bye-bye. Oh, your kids are hungry and sick? Sorry, not my problem, says Ron Johnson. I mean, they, they, these people come right out and say it. I'm not putting words in their mouths. This is what they believe. They believe this is the best we can do. This is all we should do. Their solution to racism is to claim there is no racism. Their solution to poverty is to say, work harder. And if you don't, well, then, okay, I guess you and your kids are just going to, you know, you're just going to die. Sorry, not my problem. <laughs> Their words, not mine. They say it right out loud every day. Just listen to them. So 72% of Americans think U.S. is moving in the wrong direction. I want to know who this 28% is. Who the hell is this 28%? That's got to be just people in a bubble living a happy life and not having any idea what's going on. It's the only way you could be in that 28%. Now that I think about it, I got, I have a couple of people uh, I know. Yeah, I got friends. I got family. Who would fit that description? Yep, yeah, doing okay, living in a bubble, having a fine old time. You know, you mention something going on in the news, they go, huh, what? I don't know. I don't pay attention to that. You mentioned anything political, which after a while you learn not to do. Oh, I don't, I don't care about that. Oh, politics is all, you know, they're all the same. That's the, that's the 28%. <laughs> the thing, <laughs> if thinks America is going in the right direction, anybody who thinks that has really, got their head in the sand. Lord mercy. 
<sighs> All right, what else is going on? Well, of course, we passed now. Over the weekend, we passed 900,000 dead of COVID. And as we always have to say, the numbers are probably much, much higher. It's very hard to count this. But the people who do count it all agree that, yeah, it's probably way over a million. We're still at 2,600 deaths per day, still rising. Now, the rate of increase is dropping. So it was like... 26% increase, then a 24% increase, and now it's about a 19% increase. So number of deaths going up every single day has been increasing for as long as I can remember here, for several weeks, to the point now we're up at 2,600 deaths plus per day. But the rate of the increase is slowing down. Lord, look for good news where you can find it. Hey, a friend of a friend posted this on social media. I thought I'd share it with you just because, just because. This goes way back to the publication of Eugene Debs' book, Unionism and Socialism. And it's just a little uh, excerpt for publication. And it, it looks like a photo of a very old print of this. What Socialism Demands. And I should say at the outset, I'm 100% in agreement with everything stated below. What Socialism Demands by Eugene V. Debs in his new book, Unionism and Socialism. The earth for all the people, that is the demand. The machinery of production and distribution for all the people, that is the demand. The collective ownership and control of industry and its democratic management in the interest of all the people. That is the demand. The elimination of rent, interest, and profit, and the production of wealth to satisfy the wants of all people. That is the demand. Cooperative industry, in which all shall work together in harmony as the basis of the new social order, a higher civilization, a real republic. That is the demand. The end of class struggles and class rule, of master and slave, of ignorance and vice, of poverty and shame, of cruelty and crime. The birth of of freedom, the dawn of brotherhood, the beginning of man. That is the demand. And apologies for the gender exclusive uh, language there. This is very old. There it is. Find it, print it, put it up on your wall, memorize it, send it to every potential candidate and say, where do you stand on this statement? Nobody's getting my vote unless they agree with this anymore. That's it. All right. Are we done? Have we, have we uh, hit our time allotment? Yeah, I think we're close. All right. There it is. Talk to you next time. I love you. I'm Charles Purcell. <laughs>